All right, can you hear me? You can hear yes. me, right? All right, good. So I'm Nick D'Agostino. I animate on Pinocchio. Uh, if you've uh, seen the film, my sequence was uh, Pinocchio and Candlewick uh, in the dormitory. They argue about war, and they talk about their fathers and Candlewick cries. That's my sequence, if you want to know. OK, so I want to show you how these puppets work. Uh, just first of all, off the bat, so this is a book every animator gets when you get here, OK? And it has in it, first of all, my favorite part is these eight commandments that uh, Guillermo wrote on what he was looking for, you know? The style of animation he was going for. Um, animate silence, animate mistakes. All things that were going to make the animator have to um, bring a sense of reality, uh, a kind of live action performance, you know? Something that really, we were really trying to get away from pose to pose, um, from the kind of classic Disney style, or the style that you see these days. Something that was much more um, kind of felt and nuanced and real. And then you have each character. It'll give you a little description, some references, and then it gets into some of the poses and the mechanics of the puppet. So you can see here for Geppetto, that's what's inside. Yeah. A ball socket armature. Okay? And so that means that the puppet can move basically like you can move. Elbow, wrist, shoulders can rise up, you can bend at the back, the knees, the ankles, etc. And then the, the fingers are just wired. And so you have to spend, well, as an animator, you spend a lot of time making sure you get these into a nice position. Now, in stop motion, there's two ways to do um, face movement. Okay, Outside of just doing clay, you have either replacement animation or you have head mix. Now, a place like Leica, they do mostly everything is, is uh, replacement animation. So what does that mean? That means the head comes off, and you have a box of heads. All of these are 3D printed in resin, and all the different expressions are uh, printed into the face. So it's kind of like almost like 2D animation. You're popping on a new face for every expression change. And you also have the eyes that you can independently take out and pop into the head. Now the other way, something like Corpse Bride, or if you've watched any uh, early stuff like uh, Vladislav Sterovich, it's head mechs. And now a head mech looks like this on the inside. So it's basically, it's like a little clockwork watch. It has a skull, and it has all of these little paddles so that you can move the face. And it has a silicone skin on top of it. So I can raise up the eyebrows. I can pitch them in if I want them to look nervous. And then for the mouth, I have a little gear that comes in here. And I can crank it to open the mouth. And then I come, and there's all these little paddles around the lips to get the different facial expressions. So all of the dialogue, as an animator, here it's all pre-printed. And someone else has done it, a CG animator. And then you're just replacing the faces. But here, in the moment, when you're with the puppet, you are changing the face to do all of the different expressions and all the different um, uh, phenoms for the uh, dialogue. And as an animator, it's much more exciting to do it this way because now I'm in complete control. In stop motion, you are already have a great sense of control uh, and ownership of a shot because in most animation, you would someone would do key poses and then someone else would come in and do the in-betweens. Someone's going to ink it, etc. But in stop motion, you're responsible for everything in the shot. If there's five characters in the shot, you have to animate all five by yourself. And you have to do the body, you have to do the face, and then if there's any clothing, like you can see on Volpe, he has a small coat. We have a little wire in there, and the coat will animate the fabric. In my sequence, they're, they're in bed. So there's all this fabric for the bed. So I have to animate the characters, I have to animate the face, and then I have to animate all the fabric uh, in the shot. Yes? Oh, sure, buddy, sure. So, what's genius about this design, that they've gone with both of these, because these are the two ways you do it. In most films, you would do one for everything. It would all be replacements, or it would all be met heads. And what's so genius here, I've heard Guillermo talk, and Guillermo would say that 
So people say, oh, it's about the story. Don't worry, it's not about the art. But here would say the art is the story. It's how you tell the story. And that's what's so genius here is the actual materials we get a style of animation that is appropriate for these different characters, right? So Pinocchio is wood, obviously, so he's going to need a hard head. So we do the, the resin printing, the 3D printing. But he also is much more animated than the other characters, right? He's kind of this other world. He's filled with light. So you want him to have these big, cartoony expressions. And that's what, in, and the thing is, in 3D printing, you can print a huge smile. You can print a little O, a little circle for the O. You can have these big, dramatic changes. So you have infinite expression. But the one thing you don't have is infinite subtlety. Because you would have to print a million faces to just get the corner of that mouth to curl up, right? And you're not going to do that. So unlimited expression, but limited subtlety. Now we come here to the human characters. And basically, all the other human characters are silicone mech heads. And with the mech heads, first of all, it's silicone. It's fleshy, right? It looks more human. It's a great contrast to the wood. But also, when I come in here, it's very limited in the expression. I can't get a huge smile out of this guy or a huge frown. It's limited to the skull. I can push it and pull it and move it and get some change in the expression. But I can't get huge changes. But what I can get is unlimited subtlety. So limited in the expression, but unlimited in the subtlety I can get. Because I can come in here and just, oh, just put, you, you wouldn't even see it from where you're standing. You'd have to be in a close-up with the camera to even see how little emotion you can get. You know? And sometimes you have to get a zoom on the zoom right on the eye. And I'll be in there, and I'll just be moving it enough that you can see it there, but you won't be able to see it in the wide of the shot, even if it's a close-up. But once you do enough of those, after time, you just see it slowly rise and slowly fall. And that, that level of subtlety is, is how we were getting to what Guillermo was talking about here. You know, how to get to this much more uh, kind of sense of realism, Little eye darks, little ways the eyes move. And that's another thing here. So, the eyes. I take a little needle, and I just poke it into the eye. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. It's hard to see. Let me see if I can get it in the shot. So, I poke it into the eye, and I just turn the eye. And I can also, we have eyelids printed that are stuck in between the silicone skin and the, and the eyeball. So, I can bring up the eyelid as well. And I can make them blink, and I can make them squint. So we were really focused on, on getting activating the face. Little eye darts, little ways that I would squint, just the bottom uh, eyelid coming up. Um, and that allowed for this kind of subtlety. Guillermo would say that he didn't want animation, is it, it's not, we're not looking for motion, we're looking for emotion. And this was a big thing. A lot of the um, animators have come from Leica. And they, an exquisite craft, exquisite craft. But Guillermo could see a shot where everything is flowing and everything is beautiful and maybe it's all on ones. But if he didn't feel it in the face, if he didn't feel it in the eyes, if he didn't feel like it was communicating the emotion, he wouldn't want, he would throw it back. Or he would say that wasn't a good shot. And if a shot could have some ticks in it, it could have a little less polish, but if he felt it in the face, if he felt the performance, he would love it. And that's what it was a big thing for all the animators, is realizing that it, it truly is 50% craft and 50% performance, you know? You have to be a craft person. You have to have this book. You have to know all the ways this puppet moves. You have to know exactly how you can get to all these places. You need to know how physics works with the fabric. You have to know how it works with the body and the weight of the body, but you also, need to be performing. You need to know how to bring this character to life, how to do those eye darts, how to squint the brow of it, how to make it feel like it's communicating something to you, like it's really alive. Um, and that was, that was, it was very exciting to get to, Guillermo talked to us like we were not, um, and everyone, Mark and Guillermo and Brian, it wasn't about being a craftsperson, it was about truly being a performer and embodying the character.
and coming up with things from your own life, like a, a method actor would, and not taking from you know, the lexicon of pose to pose of the kind of pantomime style that we've already seen. So it was very exciting. Um, trying to think of other things we can tell you about it. Two seconds a day. How much do you shoot? Two seconds a day. All right, that's a good day, honestly. <laughs> uh, you know, they want in two seconds a day. Um, and as in stop motion, it's just you in there. There might be two shots, a couple shots where multiple people worked on it at the same time, but for the most part, it's just you on the stage alone. They've already set up the lights, the camera's motion controls are ready to program, any lights that are moving is ready to program, and you just stay on that stage alone and you shoot those frames. And then you get the check-in from Mark and uh, the animation supervisor, Brian, every day. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Is there any questions? If anyone has a question, I might answer one. Yes? How long did it take you to shoot your scene? Yeah, it took me 10 months. 10 months, and I didn't even shoot all of the shots in that sequence, you know? I shot the stuff with them in the bed. Uh, there's a shot at the beginning where Podesta walks someone else shot that. So, but that, in stop motion, that is like what you do, you get a sequence. If you're lucky enough, you'll get a sequence. So you're, it's not that you're cast as a character, you usually have a sequence because you need to be on the stage. And that stage is gonna have one animator on it. Each stage is gonna have a different animator. So if your sequence has three characters, you're gonna do all three of those. If it has two characters, you're gonna do that. If it has 10, like, oh my God, Cesar in the church, there's all this, must be 10, 15 puppets in that. And he has to do all of that. Every shot, all 15 of those puppets. Um, yeah, but there's a thing, what's beautiful is there's a lot of prep in stop motion. We, we see the boards, we talk with the directors, they tell us what they're looking for, you can pitch an idea, then you go into a lab, a live action, either you or someone, or you, can, you direct someone else to kind of perform it, usually another animal. You perform it, you do a couple different versions, and this is where you can try things out. Am I gonna scratch here, or am I gonna scratch here? You know, what, what's gonna work? Then they'll take a look at that. They'll choose a cup, one or a couple that's cut together. They'll give you a few more <coughs> tidbits. Oh, maybe I want to move here. Maybe I want this. And then you go and animate it, right? And unless you totally crack the bed, they're going to keep the shot. And they won't be able to change it later, which is fantastic. In CG and 2D, director, producer can come in and say, you know what? Actually, let's have them scratch here. Or, you know what? Let's slow this part down. But in stop motion, you don't have that option. Because once it's shot, the shot is done. It's like, a, it's like Brad Pitt does a tape, and you're not gonna digitally alter that tape later. That's the tape, you know? And he gets to own that. And in stop motion, it's kind of the beauty is you get to own that. And there's probably, I don't know, 2,000 shots in the film, and we reshot 35. So that means most of the shots, the animated, if I'm in the moment, there was like one moment where I had uh, Pinocchio, and he was kind of, he had his finger here, and I started moving it, and it started to feel like it wanted to make a little circle. Kind of wanted to do this. And I just went with it, you know? And that wasn't something we planned, that wasn't something we rehearsed. That's something that in the moment, it's like improvisation. I just heard the note, and I just went with that. With, and I did that. And that's in the movie now, and that's mine, you know? Uh, there was another great one where Guillermo wanted, um, he would always tell me, have him caress the blankets, because they're nervous, have him caress the blankets. And, I had him turn, he was gonna press the blanket, but it kind of bounced a little bit. And it ended up going like this, like you kind of tapped the bed. And I just went with it, because I had it come down, and, and my, my follow through with this way was going too much. It didn't look like he was gonna press, so it looked like he was gonna kind of do this, and I did that. And in the end, that was uh, much more expressive of him feeling nervous, you know? And it was much more, it was a new action, because I'd already done a lot of pressing the blanket. So in that split second, just because of what was happening, and how things were kind of falling as I was animating, it created something new. Uh, and that is why I love stop motion. That's why it's the animation that I work in. Uh, it's because you're there with it, you're on stage, you really are, you're standing the entire time with the puppets, um, and, and you're in the moment with it. And, and you can kind of improvise and, and, and take things in an interesting direction, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you use Dragon of course, yeah, yeah. Dragon Frame, Jamie Cleary's Dragon Frame is the industry standard for everything. Yeah. Did you have onion skin on? I do, I topple. I don't like onion skin. It's too hard to see. If I, if, I, if I need to reset a puppet, like say something broke and they get to take a puppet off stage, I'll onion skin to like rush it back into position, but I just topple back and forth. That's how I animate. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
person to get. Yeah. Do you have any problems like running over the faces and stuff? Oh my god, are you kidding me? It's all problems. <laughs> the whole thing is just problem solving. That's what it feels like in the end. They rip, like if that's so this takes a lot of design for them to have figured out how they can make it basically an armature that looks like it's the puppet. And lots of work to print all of these faces. But in the end, this thing is durable. You could drop some on the floor if it's still animated. The silicone face is very different. The corners of the mouth, if you raise the eyebrows up, a lot of that all starts to rip. The neck can rip. I mean, I came back from a weekend and I had, had pushed Campbell's eyebrows down so far so that he could look sad. That the tension of that ripped a gap in this guy's head the size of a nickel almost, it felt like. I panicked. But then you have the puppet hospital, and they'll come in, <laughs> you do, and they rush in, you know, with goggles on and everything, and you push it, push it back into a relaxed position, they'll glue it with the silicone, they'll repaint it so you won't know, and then you push it back down, right? But it's fun, because then it's like a challenge, because there, they push it back down, but you can still kind of see there was a bit of a pop, subtle, right? So I thought, okay, I'll start him moving down into a blink, and that little bit of motion will kind of um, cover that up, you know? The same thing with like, I had these tears, and we use this gel for this tear, and every night, the gel is viscous, but it spreads, and it would spread. So you'd have to kind of clean it with little, tiny little, um, like cotton swabs, and there's always gonna be a bit of a pop. So what I had to do is every time, every time I was ending my day, I would start a blink. Because the blink, you're gonna watch the blink and you're gonna expect there to be some kind of jostle in the tear. So you have to kind of like figure out ways to work with this. Because it is just materials, you know, that are trying to fall down or trying to rip or, you know, trying to spread out like the tears. Um, and you have to find workarounds with it, you know. There's lots of limitations. So yeah, you're, you're always trying to figure it out. And, um, uh, I mean, that's like someone asks, how long is it in between frames, right? Well, it could be quick. I mean, I could take a shot, come back, oh, I got it all in position perfect, you know? Or I could be trying to get to some expression that I can't find, and I'll push this face into nine different expressions trying to get there, trying to find where it is, and it could be two hours. I had a shot with, it, with the blankets. I, I had a tool in my mouth, but I dropped it into the blankets, right? crushed it. And I can't restart the shot. I'm halfway through the shot. This shot's like 30 seconds. So I had to just calm myself down and start taking a needle and little tools and pushing the wire and pushing the fabric and pushing it all back into position and toggling back and forth until I got it to match well enough that you're not going to notice it as the audience. You know? And so that's, that frame took three hours. Don't tell Mark that. <laughs> you know? So that's how it goes. Yeah. Everything is different, and that's the exciting thing about it. Any other questions? Let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, I got one back there, LA. Right, so the book will have a description of the character. It'll have the references uh, of the different films and movies, right, that you're, you're thinking about. Then you have, of course, you have Guillermo, you have Mark, and you have Brian, the animation supervisor. And that's kind of their job, as far as this, is to be tracking these characters throughout. So when I go in and get brief, they're talking about the character and what this character would do in this sequence, you know? But there's also kind of an amazing thing in, in casting the animators, right? So a great example is um, Volpe, right? Volpe kind of has almost a split personality. He's a performer, but he's also this very vicious character, you know? And so they, Dan Ramsey, who's a great animator from Hardman, and he does this very cartoony style, you know? Really big, really popping, really great mouth shapes. It's because that's what he learned from Hardman animation. He does that while also running. So he does Volpe when he comes to Pinocchio and is trying to convince him to join the circus, right? And he has this big flamboyant style. But then Jan Maas, who is a, a Leica animator, he likes to do very realistic, and subtle animation. They put him on when uh, Volpe is beating Spaz, right? 
and it has this real sense of realism. It almost looks rotoscoped. It has this strange reality of weight, and it's completely different. If you watch those side by side, even though the character is still, you know, it has some of the same you know, sense of the character, the performances are so different, uh, but it works for that character. So you kind of cast people to do, you know, like me, I'm a sad, crying little boy, and that's why I did, <laughs> who has problems with his dad. So that's why I did that sequence, you know? I've worked in live action a lot. So before you're shot, they're in their lighting, right? So you can go and talk and figure out what they're trying to do, you know? Um, like, it's a great, like, um, like, eye light, right? I always, as an anime, want to know where is the eye light, where are they putting the eye light, and making sure I get a good eye light, right? So then, with the puppet, you know, like, if the puppet's looking, they get that little glint in the eye, they, they feel alive. And then you can play with that. Maybe the character looks down, looks sad, the eyes start to get, they lose the eye light, it looks a little dead. And then you can kind of come back into it. So you work with them on that. And then, like I have a, in that sequence, these um, searchlights that are scanning, right? And uh, the DP, Frank, uh, did a lot of work. They do um, tests with the motion control to make sure that it's coming at the right part of the dialogue or the right moment. And then you as the animator can bring that in and watch. Okay, now I know this is when the searchlight's coming here. Or this is when the red searchlight's coming. And you perform with that, you know? So I'm gonna want them to turn in this moment. I want, I mean, we know this line of dialogue is when the red light's gonna come. So you are working with them. They're trying to work with the script and the moment in the story. They're looking at your live action reference as a reference for where these moments are gonna happen. And then you as the animator are in there trying to work with that lighting. So yeah, it is, it, if you're doing it right, you're really uh, kind of in sync with your, with your lighting department. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. So with um, the three printed Nokia heads, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you talked about improvising being in the moment, but with something so rigid, was there, was there for a moment where you got to say, well, I'd really love it if we had to make you this face. Yeah. And, and, and can we like, take a day and print a new head? Or take well, you, won't, you have, here, I'll show you. Um, so you have, this is just for the eyes of Cricket, right? And so that's another cool thing. So Cricket has 3D printed eyes, right? And so you can see this chart here. That's all of the different eye choices you have. Now Pinocchio's face is like four times the size of this, right? And so I'll know this is the wide eye. And then I can go uh, even wider from there. Then I can go to the widest. And in that I have, you know, a left one, an up one, a down one, and I know how many increments I have in between. So maybe I want a little more of a cushion on that one, and I can see, oh, there's another increment in there, right? Uh, and so you can go, you, they, will, they will make a new face, but they, you know that there's, maybe there's an in-between, maybe there's a sad eye here, maybe there's an angry eye here. Uh, and you can go in and trade those out with them. And also, they're looking at your live action reference, the performance you've done, and they're trying to match, even down to the blinks, and trying to make sure your X sheet and the faces is gonna match all of what you're doing in the live action performance. Um, and the one last thing I'll say, it's really cool, so Cricket has these printed eyes, but he has wire here, and he has a paddle for his uh, mustache, and Spaz has uh, replacements for the mouth, so you get these big, kooky monkey mouths, but yet he has the eyes and the brow are like Geppettos. They're the silicone with the paddle. And I think it's so fascinating because those two characters are in between these worlds. You know, they're not fully the cartoon characters, but they're not fully human either. So even in the uh, design of the puppets, uh, each one of the characters, that it just, as an animator, you come and you have to kind of animate it the way it needs to be animated because of how they made it. So it's just so exciting to see that down to the kind of just the crafting of the puppets, how much the art and the design uh, works hand in hand and, and with the story, you know, and requires it to look that way. This is fascinating to me. I think everyone involved um, really loved the project and they were really uh, smart about how to use this craft. Yeah, one more. Uh, I don't know if you're a question, maybe, but overall, like, what was your favorite part, like, to work on this? 
My favorite part of that sequence that I worked on? Yeah. Uh, two shots. One, the first shot I did, the real first shot I did in the sequence where they fight with each other. Um, they keep fighting, they keep rising up. And I had thought, oh, they should keep trying to get higher than the other one. And Guillermo liked that, so I was excited that I worked out it. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on that shot, and uh, I managed to execute it with all the fabric, with all the dynamic motion. And really trying to arc that, really trying to start subtle and build that tension and build that anger, uh, and then have this kind of big explosion where they both slam themselves down to bed. And in one shot, really trying to create like a three act structure with this, this motion between the two of them. And that was really exciting. And then the last shot I did, which was uh, Candlewick listening, he's just listening. Uh, it's a Pinocchio, and he starts to cry, and he wipes a tear, and he wipes his nose, um, and then at the end he turns and just says, um, are you scared? And in that, I just had one character, and I don't have the, the, the bodies, I don't have the bags, I don't have all the fabric, I just have one character's face, but I have to do the same thing. I have to find a way to vary the pace and to build up the tension of that moment, of that shot of you listening, and then find a way to kind of bring a denouement and, and a finale as he turns and finally says something to Pinocchio. Um, and so it was, two, it was two very different ways of having to, you know, having a substantial amount of time to be able to build kind of a little arc, uh, but having to do it in two different ways completely. Where now, before it was a, a character jumping up in bed, and now it's just how the eyes will frown and squint and, and, and how he'll come and wipe his nose but trying to give that the same amount of, of variety and, and kind of dynamic motion so that you feel involved in it, just on a much more micro scale. So the, the challenge of those two was, was really fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, one, one more question then? Until they, until they tell me to leave, let's keep going. How long the animation of Oh my God. Soft goods. <laughs> Soft goods are very difficult, you know, because of form of it. Okay. Soft goods are very difficult because all you have is fabric with a little wire in it, you know. So that pillow, we had a bit of wire and some foam stuff in it, you know. So when it's thrown, it's in the air. We have a rib, an external rib that will hold it for a few frames, right? And then they'll they'll paint that out. Of it. But it's, it's it was a very challenge getting the fabric to kind of move in a natural way, getting the, the pillow to compress enough to really feel like you're squishing it. Yeah, it, it just, it's just like a struggle. It's like hard to express. Like You have little, like I, I, I would tie their little hands into it with little screws. You, here, if you cut open, there's a little screw hole. So you could screw it in and then have some way, and then as it co compresses it, you know, I'd actually go in, tighten the joint so it could hold it down, you know? Uh, and then when it comes out, let it loosen. And you just, yeah, you just have to keep on. Struggle. It's like it's a weird struggle with the materials. As you're trying to force it into the right this kind of look, you know. And you work with you also work with the set department and the props department, and they'll come in and you'll tell them, you know, maybe we'll try one with wire on the outside. Okay, they'll try that. Uh, yeah, it's not going to really work. You know, you're testing it. Not, okay, maybe we can do a wire on the inside, inside the phone. You know, so you work with them a little bit to kind of find what what's really going to work. But the thing is. We're not, we don't have time to really test all this out. The most you might get is a block where you do it on like fours and you kind of figure it out. But once you're in the shot, it's like, like I say, it's like this improvisation. Like you have to just get it to work. Uh, someone came up to me and was like, oh man, this candle with face you did, it was so perfect. You looked so sad, but you know, usually it's hard to get that face to do that much. How did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I was super frustrated. I knew what I wanted, I just kept getting mad and pushing it until it was there. No, no, no. It's, a, it's art, not science. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, is that we good? Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. I think we're all settled now. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. I always have to figure out how loud I need to be for what room I'm in. So, good afternoon. I'm excited to see you all here. My name is Tracy Miller Zarnicki, and you might recognize that from. Disney animation credits or animation documentaries or some of the books I've written over the decades, but you're not really here to see me, so I'm gonna stop with that and say I am thrilled to be here today, back at Nucleus, this amazing place, to uh, host another amazing uh, filmmakers panel, this time with the incredibly talented team behind the film Pinocchio that I think I saw a lot of hands raised you've already seen on Netflix, am I right? Yes, okay, excellent. 
So speaking to this group today, I know I can keep my panelists' introduction short because you already know who everybody is. You guys are always a really well-studied audience. So I'm going to do some short intros of who's up here today. And you guys, if I miss anything that you really want said about you, feel free to chime in. But I'll start at the far end here today. Uh, we have Grizz Greenlee. Grizz is a character designer on the film, but comes to us all the way from Nebraska. Uh, he knew he was meant to be an artist from his youngest days. He's an award-winning illustrator, best known for his macabre yet humorous drawings. I'm sure you already know his work very well. Um, he's got a wide range of it across all mediums, books, film, animation, apparel design, consumer products. His work is everywhere and we love it. Uh, his career started with a book called Monster Museum and then went into a hugely successful run of t-shirt graphics for Hot Topic, uh, inspired by his own take on fairy tales and nursery rhymes and other classic childhood stories. Uh, he's got an impressive list of published works uh, illustrating the stories of classic authors like Edgar Allan Poe, Ray Bradbury, Sir Conan Doyle, and even more contemporary folks like Neil Gaiman. Uh, plus all kinds of work with studios, Disney, DreamWorks, Henson, Netflix. Uh, and in particular, his production design and character design is, is what we're thrilled to talk to him with, the, uh, with him about today for Pinocchio, which is unlike any other film I've seen. So we're glad you're here, Gris. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. That was long. <laughs> Excellent. And next on our dais today, we have Guy Davis. Uh, Guy is the co-production designer and character designer on Pinocchio, and he's worked as a creature designer, concept artist, uh, illustrator, storyboard artist. I think I've covered most of that. But again, a wide range of stuff, film, television, comic book, video games, he's all over the place. Uh, he's got a long history of work with Guillermo del Toro, including the television series The Strain, Pacific Rim, the film, uh, Crimson Peak, uh, Shape of Water, right? Okay, and um, prior to all that, he was also the main artist for the Hellboy spinoff, BPRD, and also created his own comic, The Marquee. So that's Guy. Thank you for being here, Guy. Thank you. And seated right next to me is Mark Gustafson. He's the director of Pinocchio, alongside Guillermo del Toro. Uh, Mark's legendary, I'm gonna say legendary, I hope it doesn't make you feel old, but it is legendary. Um, his, his stop motion career has, pan, has spanned four decades. He's served as supervising director on the PJs, uh, animation director on Fantastic Mr. Fox, director on 200 plus, how is this possible? 200 plus shorts and commercials. That's amazing. Um, and some of you might be old enough to know the classic California Raisins commercial that I know very well. So, um, yeah, see, I, I knew your work way before I ever My got to meet you. My mom loved them. Right. So wait, how old does that make me? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, he, he's won two Emmys, two Eddies, and a Clio so far. Is there more that I missed on that list? Think, no, that's think enough. That, that's that's, that's yeah. respectable I don't get greedy. in its own. <laughs> uh, but but I, I very much hope that that count clicks upward with this project today. So I, I, my fingers are crossed for that. So thank you for being here, Mark. We're thrilled to have you. <laughs> All right, so knowing we only have until about 2.45 up here, I'm going to go through a bunch of questions that I hope covers a great range of their experiences up here. Uh, and then we want to get you into signing time. So I'm going to start, let's see, let's start with Grizz all the way down there. Um, so you have a long history with Pinocchio outside of this particular Pinocchio. Uh, can you share with us why, in the first place, you were drawn to interpret that classic in your own way long ago? Yeah. Um, so this is over 20 years ago and I was approached by Tor to illustrate Pinocchio and I didn't really know much about it other than the Walt Disney version and um, you know when I read it I, I at, at the time period it was just gonna be a cover they're just gonna have me illustrate the cover for it and um, I read the book and loved it so much and saw the comparison to uh, Frankenstein and I told him that um, it needed to be fully illustrated. 
So they said they didn't have much more money in it. And I said, I don't care. I would like to illustrate the whole book. Um, and so they agreed. They got me a little more money. And um, I did the book. And after I turned it all in, they were so happy with, with what they had that they ended up making it into a hardcover, limited edition hardcover, because it was only going to be like a mass market paperback at the time. Um, and that beautiful hardcover has got like, a, like, an emb like an embossed Pinocchio on the cover and cloth bound. It's, it's great if you can get your hands on it. Um, so that's how that, that all started. And then what brought you into this particular Pinocchio? Tell us that. So path. this is where um, I think shows that magic really exists in the world and synchronicity and things happen. Um, I had an idea, so the book was done and I had an idea to make it into an animation. And me and some friends came up with an idea and um, kind of talked about directors that we would want to direct. And Guillermo del Toro was top on the list to approach. And then shortly after that, I got a call from a gallery that was showing my Pinocchio artwork. And they said, Guillermo del Toro just came in here and bought a piece of your Pinocchio art. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Can you get me a lunch meeting with them? And they said, yes. So I met with Guillermo and I talked to him about the Pinocchio and um, he was enthusiastic and this was, this was about 20 years ago and um, it was, it's been a long road since then but he was um, always, I don't know, it's, it's weird to have that kind of synchronicity occur in your life. I don't know if it's weird, I think it's just meant to be. That's what definitely. it sounds like. Definitely some of the, the sprites kind of figures in the world making things happen. So yeah. I'll, I'll take that. So yeah, you mentioned 20 years. This, this project coming into being is definitely a long, long project from, from when Guillermo had first been thinking about it and talking about it. And so Guy, have you been involved with it for as long or? Uh, not, not as long as, as you for sure and a lot less long than uh, I think it was 2008 was the original like concept launch and we had uh, a couple artists, Huey Vu and Rustam Hasanoff working on it and I think Keith Thompson in that phase and I actually came on in 2012 when it was a redesign phase. Oh, so only a decade ago. Yeah, I only mean, a decade. Come on. So yeah. <laughs> I still had hair then. So uh, <laughs> so yeah, I came in at 2012 and that's uh, when I started doing just redesigns of some characters and things and there's a bit of a pause until 2018, and Guillermo asked me to come back as a co-production designer, along with Kurt Enderly, and we basically started redesigning everything again. You know, I mean, some things, like obviously we had Gris's amazing Pinocchio to, to work off of, and Hui's um, Geppetto was pretty close to it. And I think the only other things that carried over to 2018 was the dogfish and the black rabbits. Those we didn't really change anymore. But there was a bunch of new characters. There was Death, there was the Wood Sprite, there was new uh, versions for Volpe and stuff. So, yeah. Wonderful. Amazing that it's been 10 plus years at least for everybody involved with this. Almost everybody involved with this. So, Mark, let's talk about now we established your long standing history in stop motion. Let's, let's jump back to that for a minute and just tell us how did you get so embroiled in that style of art? Tell us about your stop motion history a bit? Uh, well, well, before I do that, I want to make sure that um, we really acknowledge uh, Grizz's um, contribution to this movie. Uh, Guillermo always, always talks about that Pinocchio design that Grizz did. And he, he said, that if you don't have Pinocchio, you, you can't make a Pinocchio movie. And there was something about that design that Grizz did that really uh, struck a chord with Guillermo, and I think with all of us. And that really was the launching pad um, for this for this whole film. Um, in terms of me, thank I, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, before Mark, before you go back, then let, let's stay on that for a minute and just how so Pinocchio in stop motion seems like this is what was meant to be. Like, was this always going to be a stop motion film, or did the the character design and that 
make it become a stop motion? No, it was like, always going to be stop motion. Okay. Um, okay. Guillermo, uh, as a young man, uh, did stop motion. He had a studio. Uh, it was one of the first things he did. Um, he, he always tells a story about uh, he was going to make a film with a group of, of his friends, and they had made 100 puppets and built all this stuff. And one night they went out to dinner, uh, and they came back, and someone had um, broken into their studio, and uh, finding nothing of value, they smashed all of his puppets, all of them. Oh, my God. And beyond that, they uh, they urinated and pooped on everything. Oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, Guillermo says, the poop puppet they comes got from him now? ready, got him ready yeah. for working in Hollywood, you know, so. Um, <laughs> but no, it was always going to be stop motion. Um, uh, I think, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is a puppet, you know, it's a puppet puppet world mm -hmm. with a puppet in it and we thought it was really interesting that here's uh, Pinocchio who is actually a puppet and he's the only one who doesn't really act like a puppet in this world and there was something really exciting about that idea for us yeah I think setting it in the backdrop with fascism and all that like was really took that to a whole other level yeah. in this story yeah so. I mean fascism if you think about it is a, a another form of uh, paternal relationship and the film is about as cricket says you know uh, fathers and sons you know failed basically and uh, and fascism really is uh, you know this father figure uh, for a country who wants everybody to walk in lockstep uh, so for us thematically it was really uh, it seemed like an appropriate uh, setting the yeah, film. there's so many levels of it in this story. And again, like I know I've read a number of articles with Guillermo talking about the father-son story being so important to him, you know, from the get-go. And then, and then this yeah. incarnation of it is, is so deep. Yeah, and, and ultimately it's a film about Geppetto learning to be a father. You know, it's, it's, it could almost be called Geppetto instead of Pinocchio because if you see, if you think about it, Pinocchio doesn't really change much at all over the course of the whole film. He just, you know, he's born into the world, he's naked, uh, like all of us, I guess, and, uh, and unfinished, because uh, he was, you know, he was made by a drunk. Uh, um, again, probably like many of us were. <laughs> but uh, then, you know, this puppet goes out into the world and he's just trying to figure it out, and everybody that he comes into contact with changes because they they see something in him his his freedom and his purity and in the case of Geppetto you know he begs for a miracle he's, he's lost his son Carlo he gets it and then he doesn't recognize it he's he, he doesn't see it for what it is so the, through the whole course of the film he's that's what he's learning he's learning that Wait, it happened. I just need to accept it. I need to recognize love. I don't need to find it. Yeah, I think I think he was definitely <laughs> Geppetto. Definitely was a little shocked by what what he did create. Um, it's like I, the Frankenstein story. It's the same story. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in my book, there's uh, the Pinocchio book. There's a couple pages in. There's a little. Uh, there's a picture of. Geppetto carving Pinocchio. I think it's for like the chapter pages or something like that. And th th to show homage to Frankenstein, he's looking at a book that's the, the modern Prometheus, and that's where he's getting his. And if you know Frankenstein, that's the other title for it. So it's kind of uh, a little nudge of how I saw that. Um, that Pinocchio was so um, raw and abandoned, you know, it's like, uh, the anger that Geppetto has towards Pinocchio is the same kind of anger that Frankenstein has for the creature that he, he makes. And, um, and wanting it to be something else, Frankenstein wanted the creature to be more of a, of a, a human, and, but didn't want to take the time to teach him how to be a human, and abandons him. And, and it's the same story with Pinocchio. Yeah. Definitely, and, and, and Pinocchio definitely comes into this story in such a whirlwind way. Like the energy, I think, was, was not only shocking for Geppetto, but maybe for audiences in a, in a yeah. great way. 
Yeah, he's a little shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I wasn't going to put it that way, but... No, but it was important for us to show that he was a handful. He was difficult. He's brand new. Um, and he's shocking to Geppetto. Geppetto is this older guy who all of a sudden has this, you know, young kid. And it's a lot to deal with, you know. And, and you'll, you'll also notice that when we show Carlo, his first son, we sort of present most of it in the form of uh, this, um, this montage, sort of a flashback with music. And so it's sort of this romanticized version of Carlo. So who knows if that was even how that kid was, but in, in Geppetto's mind, that's how he sees his lost son. He's now romanticized him into something perfect. And then this new thing comes along and he wants it to match this perfection that he's probably largely invented. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, Gris, having created this Pinocchio, like, what did that feel like, seeing him come to life in this film now? Well, I think it's amazing because when, I, when you draw a picture, you have to envision, you, you don't, I don't envision, I think it's maybe for every, all the artists, but you don't envision it as a two-dimensional thing. You see it in, in the world and you see it walking around, you see how it moves. And um, when I first saw, you know, the roughs getting um, with the animation, I was like, that's, that's exactly how Pinocchio moved in my head when I did the book. So it was amazing to see it come to life like that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I wonder, um, guys, is there any other character coming to life moment that, that in this film really felt like, oh, we, we, we captured this? Like, is there anything that really... I don't know, in design might have been challenging, but when it actually came to the screen in full life, oh. how did that feel? I mean, I think any design that you work on and you see it go from a drawing to a maquette to a sculpt, it starts feeling even more real when it's like stop motion because it's, it's seeing, you know, almost like a one-on-one -on -one of a, a small drawing is now a puppet. And then, you know, I was gonna say a few months, but many months later, we see it moving and you hear the voice. Uh, it's a surreal, you know, magical experience. I think, obviously, there are certain designs that, you know, me and Guillermo collaborate on, like Death and the Wood Sprite. That was very magical to see on film, lit by Frank, uh, passing him and everything coming to life. But also, I think, like, uh, you know, Candlewick just the fact that he had a lot more character than I would have expected when we started designing him. I mean, he goes through an arc, but it was, um, you don't know exactly all the lines and stories when you're designing something, because the story's still being written, but seeing like the emotion that the animators brought out in him uh, was incredible. Yeah, actually, I actually want to dive into the, the character expressions in their animation, because cause you had established, or Guillermo had established, or as a team, the Eight Commandments of Pinocchio animation, which I don't know if other people know about this yet, but I was fascinated to read them and to go, gosh, you really did stick to this in, in this film. So maybe if, if you guys, maybe Mark, start with uh, talking through like different characters and, and you know their expressions, like you've got Pinocchio, then you've got humans, and you've got deities, you've got animals. Like, tell us how you, you sort of bring them to life in unique ways. Well, I think one thing that uh, both Guillermo and I were really uh, intent on was uh, making them feel like they had actually lived lives. Um, we didn't want to be really broad with the animation. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a danger in animation to um, uh, just express everything in the sort of simplest terms or sort of these these gestures and things that we're all familiar with. And we were like, no, let's, let's, let's try and make this more sophisticated if we can in terms of the, the acting. And one of, those, one of the things we did was um, this notion of failed acts. So uh, it, things like, you know, if I'm, I'm reaching for this water bottle on a character and I'm, I'm like, you know, it's, it's two or three movements to get it as opposed to just go get it lift it up. That's a very, very simple example. But if you apply that to, um, to each of the characters, you say, oh, well, Geppetto is old. So when he, when he gets up, 
okay, he's got to lean. He's got to lean this way, and then put his hands back, and then you know this. We really focused on who the characters were and what that would mean uh, in, in terms of their motion in, in the real world and just said, we're going to take the time to do this stuff. And when I say take the time, you know, animating something like that, something very simple takes days and days and sometimes weeks. So, Do you have a certain scene in mind you could tell us like that took way longer than you thought it would, but well, you know, there, it was way worth it, obviously? Um, well, the, there's one scene where Spazatura, the monkey, comes running down into the carnival and he's sort of swinging on this line and then he runs through and there's all this stuff going on. They're, they're setting up the carnival and he jumps over things, goes under things and sort of getting in people's way and he leads us up to the, to the uh, carriage that, um, that Volpe is in. And that shot took um, well, well over three months for us to do. More, in fact, more than that, depending on how you actually do the calculation, because we would set up the camera, you know, figure out all the blocking, run test after test after test, and bring an animator in and you know push the characters through, because you have to make sure they're all you know they're hitting hitting their marks, the camera's in focus, everything's in light, and uh, it just it takes forever, and, but that, that's the nature of stop motion. Yeah, and it's amazing though. Like, just having... ask Nick. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Nick Nick shared a lot of that. Um, I think that um, I had to watch this a couple times to really appreciate some of like you're talking about the failed motions and the fit. Like you know, like if I'm gonna get my hair out of my face or something, you you don't usually think to bother to put that into such an intensely detailed character movement, right? But it adds so much when you when you do take that moment to make one each uniquely human or animal like or whatever it is but uniquely moving yeah i mean it was more important to us to that these characters um emote emotionally than that the animation was uh perfect efficient yeah or efficient yeah um and that's something we discussed with the animators a lot it's like we didn't try and make the slickest most perfectly animated stop motion film that's ever been made. Um, there are others that are technically probably cleaner and more beautifully animated in a technical sense. But we were really focused on, on the, the characters and the performances and the emotion that was coming across. So we told the animators that's what to focus on, not the technical precision of the animation. And I. I, I feel like it comes across when you watch the film. I, I feel like, though, it, it is beautiful. You said you may not be the most beautiful. I think it's extremely beautiful on how everything was so unique. And, and you know, again, going back to the, every bit of character design and set design, there's such care and detail into every level, at least well, that I, I can see as a viewer. I think if the audience is invested in the characters and the story, they will forgive a lot. And, and we weren't asking people to forgive too much, but I think you read more into it. If, you, if you're cheering for these characters or you're really interested in them, there's a lot of the stuff around the edges does, just doesn't matter as much. Well, even still, like I'm, I'm going to jump to Guy for a second. I want to hear about um, some of the sets in the film that were designed because I think I read there were 99 sets. Is that true? Yeah. Possible? Yeah. I can't even imagine building that much. But but talk to us about um, you know again like the the motion that you were just describing with Basatura coming through and like there's some scenes that were so complicated. How do you design these sets to allow this kind of work? I guess is is the big question that just blows my mind to think about. Well, luckily, I had you know the amazing Kurt Enderley as, as co-production designer and uh, a great you know art director Rob Dessou. So uh, a lot of you know their expertise is the technical side of stuff. So I come in with you know the fun job being like you know here's the inside of a wagon or here's this like set you know and that's my first step is just trying to think of the environment that would get approved by Guillermo and Mark. And then as it gets, you know, brought into like set build and architecture, then we got to think of like what needs to be pulled away so the actual animators can, you know, be inside it and animate from different angles and stuff. But we also had, uh, you know, the same way the characters are a lot more of a caricature and stylized. We treat the buildings the same way. 
So Kurt would find amazing historical reference, and he even did like a timeline of the town saying, you know, in this era, you know, this is what the, the architecture would look like, and then maybe there was an earthquake and this building would fall. So it had a history to itself instead of just saying, well, here's a, a crack in a building. We knew why that building had a crack, which gave it a, a sense of, of purpose and history to the characters to live in. And it was always about, uh, and Guillermo was very sure to, to include that history and that sort of research because it's a way of keeping things feeling too whimsical. We didn't want it to be like a, a cartoon town, you know, like Toontown or something. You know, we wanted to feel like it's a stylized caricature of a real town that these caricatures would live in and just become its own character. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you definitely had a sense in the church, like a certain vibe versus, you know, in the mm -hmm. carnival. Like, you, you, I think that each set definitely brought a, a, a feel f with it that yeah. um, carried through and supported the story. You know, totally. it's, it's and we had really, you know, we had more, you know, fantastical sets. Like the, the training camp was a lot more stylized, modernist, purist than... Uh, like let's say the town and the realm of death, but you know, the way they were built and painted and distressed, they all fit. It doesn't seem like any set is out of place to each other. It still feels a, a cohesive world, which is what we wanted. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I know we only have a couple minutes left. What I kind of want to do, if you don't mind coming back up the dice, we'll start with Grizz. I want you to talk to us about watching the film in its entirety. Like, if you can separate all the other versions of it you've seen, watching it full finished, was there any particular moment that, that really touched you more deeply than you thought it would, or anything that, that came across strongly that surprised you? Well, I guess the first time, I went up to Portland um, last spring and got to see some of the sets and uh, in progress, and that's, what I have to talk about, because that's when it first struck me what kind of a film this was going to be. And, um, you know, I probably saw about half of it, and some of it still had green screen behind it. But at that moment, I could tell how emotional it was. Um, I, I saw the scene where Geppetto kind of um, floats up onto the shore, and, it, and how well the animation was for that, and um, the whole end scene. and. With green screen behind it, I was still about to tear up, and I think that is a you know says a lot about the quality of the film. When even if it's not even in those rough stages, it can still grab your emotional cord. And I hadn't even watched the whole thing yet, so um, you know that's just a testament to how well of a film it was. And that's right. Yeah, definitely. Guy, what about you? Talk about any oh. part of this process, whether it is the final or, or um, like Reese had said, earlier even. Yeah, I think it's just the, it's a bit surreal, you know, you, you look at some of these being the start of the process, the concept designs and stuff on the wall, and, and you remember those, those days, but I've probably seen the film like, you know, five times now, and I, I still can't really look at it technically. I still just start watching it like I'm watching a, a movie I love, and I, I get lost in the story and the characters. I'm not looking at it like, well, you know, that part translated from this part, and I remember this designer that, you know, it's, it's always separate from the memories of working on it. When I watch the film, I get lost in it and, you know, start crying like everybody else and, <laughs> you know, come back even to, to cry a second time, so. Yeah, I definitely cried multiple times watching it. My my boys who are really young men now would walk through the room like, what is wrong with you, Mom? I'm like, I'm watching this way. So, so I definitely am right there with you. That they, There are a lot of moments that really touched, you know, my heart deeply in, in a surprising way. But Mark, let's, let's talk about it because obviously you uh, well, have a lot of influence on these moments. I think that, you know, I learned something on every single project that I work on. And I learned a lot on this one because I worked on it for so long. But I, th I think th what I, and I should have known this long ago since I've been doing this forever, but you know, a, a film is not a math problem. It's not ultimately about connecting all, every single dot and getting the logic perfect. Uh, I think a film is more, uh, uh, and particularly a stop motion film, is a watercolor. 
because you have to take into account the medium and you have to let it speak in a way that you know water and pigment sort of flow and you have to you have to be willing to accept what that gives you and that's I think very true of stop motion um, as well um, you, you think about these um, pigments as the emotions and you have to let them wash into you know all the corners of this story um, and if you're lucky uh, then everybody starts crying <laughs> <laughs> or laughing. I don't think it's luck, but I, I think it was success, I will say. I think you, you, the work that, that you all put into this and, and the team that can't be here today, obviously, we can't have everybody here, but, but I, I have to say in, in the three decades I've been watching animated films as an adult type person, this one has hit me more deeply than so, so, so many others that I just, I am in awe of what you've done, so. And the team, I think that's really important. I, I don't want to forget, so many artists worked on this film. Uh, they all became my family for years. Um, and we just poured ourselves into it. Really, really talented people who genuinely cared about this uh, project. And you can, you can see it in every frame. Um, this was something that we made with our hands and with our hearts. Uh, and we're, we're all very proud of it. Yeah, and it's a, it was a huge team that's, you know, we're the same enthusiasm and love and care through, you know, all the days filming, through the pandemic, when that started, and all, they, they never lost, you know, that, that drive for it. And I think that's a lot to, you know, sort of say about, you know, Guillermo and Mark and the entire production, is it was an incredible experience to be part of. Yeah, it seems like a very a, a deep family connection for you all, and, and it, it shows, I think. The love that you put into this shows in the screen, and, and, and we're so grateful that you were able to bring that together for us, even if it took decades. We are, we're glad that it finally has come to be that we could experience it. So Two decades. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met my wife. We got married. We had kids. Like, so much, like, that's like half my life. So <laughs> it's insane. It's amazing. It's amazing. And worth it, though. I yeah. mean, you know, good things come to those who wait, right? That's, that's the yeah. thing. But um, your, 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 your patience and your, your trust in this process, all of you, I think has paid off. So we're, we're grateful that you could share it with us. And, and I think I've come to the point where I'm supposed to cut us off for this and say, thank you all for listening to our conversation. I imagine you're ready for signing. Thank you. So.